Thank you, Allison. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, just to start, this is the agenda for the webinar. First of all, there's a little bit of orientation. Then I'll talk about why we use local data and sort of some concepts there. Then we'll look at some comprehensive sources of data that you may be familiar with or uh, may be a good place to start for using data. And finally, some demonstrations of websites where you can find um, some of your key indicators, demographics and economic data, as well as other uh, programs that can help you tell your story. Um, these are some kids so I'm familiar with uh, diaper needs myself. And um, first, um, Data Haven is a National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership Program, and I'll talk a little bit about those later, but basically we're a nonprofit that collects data from around the state of Connecticut and helps people interpret it and uh, kind of facilitates data sharing among other nonprofits and agencies in order to um, democratize data. We're a network of about 50 cities based at the Urban Institute in Washington, D.C. Um, there is a chat feature, so hopefully in your WebEx center you can see the, um, at the lower right there's an area where you can send questions to everyone, and I think Allison will be helping me with uh, the recording of those questions, so feel free to send those in at any time on the chat, and I think we'll try to answer those at the end of the webinar. Um, within the Within the slides, which we can send out later, there are links to the websites that we'll be showing. So the best way um, is probably to follow along on the screen, and then later on, if you want to go back to the websites that have been shown, you can refer to the slides and the links there. Okay. Thank you. So why, why do you use local data? Well, as I'm sure you know, the, there's often more variation within towns than between one town and another town. So in this chart, you can see that um, if you look at the demographics for adults having high school or college degrees, they're actually pretty similar between Connecticut and our suburbs of New Haven and the city of New Haven. In New Haven, we have slightly more adults without a high school degree, but we also have slightly more adults with a master's degree or higher. Um, however, if you look at a neighborhood level, you can see the, um, the three lines at the bottom of this chart. If you break the city of New Haven into thirds, basically between higher income neighborhoods uh -huh. and lower income neighborhoods, you can see that um, the data is actually very different depending on what part of the city that you're in, so that um, the higher income sections of New Haven have uh, very few adults without a high school degree, and most adults have college or advanced degrees. And the opposite is sort of true in, in the lower income neighborhoods. You primarily have adults with uh, high school degrees or less. And this is just another way that we, we show that. Um, essentially, uh, when you're using data, it helps to have the national and state and local comparisons uh, in order to tell your story. So. One of the principles we use is to have those three areas. And then you can see here that uh, this chart shows children in low-income families, so children under six who have uh, incomes that place them less than twice the poverty level, which would essentially make them eligible for a variety of, of subsidies or programs or benefits, um, make their families eligible for those. So you can see, again, um, in the suburbs or the outer ring suburbs, the rates are similar to the state, and they're higher in New Haven, but again, at the neighborhood level, there are some neighborhoods where um, the children are predominantly low income and others where the rates are, are lower than the state average. So this slide, um, again, shows some sort of uh, questions that might come up when you're deciding which data to use. One is to think of your target audience. So the Diaper Bank, the National Diaper Bank Network has a resource page, uh, which I'll show in a minute, that sort of describes the nature of the problem. So, uh, you know, rather than having a, a base uh, poverty figure that you may see in other programs, the, the Diaper Bank has some recommendations about which uh, 
data are most relevant to diaper needs. So for example, the, um, they look primarily at children under the age of six for that, and if possible, you know, you'd be looking at the zero to three range. Um, other questions that come up, I'll, I'll show you in this data even guide on needs assessment. And in addition to these two and what you see through your network, there are a variety of other excellent guides online that um, describe um, sort of best practices and data use and how to tell your story and evaluate your programs in a way that relates to the data that you're presenting. So this is the example from the National Diaper Bank Network on their resource page. Hopefully you can see this. And it, again, it shows um, one of the concepts is you know, rather than looking just at the official poverty rate, looking at the poverty rate for children and how that's distributed between different types of families so that you can understand in your community which families are most likely to, to be um, needing diapers. And then the other resource I shared was the uh, Data Haven page on needs assessment. And this just goes through um, sort of example, um, some principles on what data is helpful versus not helpful. So again, um, if you're targeting a local area, having data that represents the specific neighborhoods where you're working, or the groups of towns or boroughs or census tracts neighborhoods versus just aggregate levels for a county, um, those will tend to be much more helpful. And then um, also just looking at uh, raw numbers as well as percentages so that um, you can communicate the, um, the extent of the need. Um, having comparison data to give people context on what, uh, what the issue looks like you know, beyond your own community. And uh, again, uh, very specific data to the problem you're addressing, so that's fairly straightforward. Um, and then if you're using, um, often you can find excellent data from uh, journals or other publications, and you can cite those directly in your grants or applications. Um, so just, it's best in that case not to use um, newspaper articles necessarily, but to really look for um, agency publications or peer-reviewed publications or possibly uh, publications from like other advocacy groups in your area when you're citing data. And then to use recent data where, where you can and to present your data in a very specific way. So these are some of the comprehensive data sources which are a good place to start uh, when you're looking at children's health, children's well-being, debt and diaper need. Um, there are obviously many more than this, but these are a couple I picked out uh, just in case you aren't familiar with them. One is Kids Count from the Casey Foundation, other partners. The other is NCCP, which I'll show in a minute. And then in addition to those two, um, you should be aware of local sources of data, data centers. Those include NNIP partners like Data Haven, um, often based at foundations or universities. We, we happen to be a standalone nonprofit, but they, they range. Um, they're in different locations depending on which city you're in. There's also state data centers, which are a network of um, mostly universities or labor departments around the, all 50 states which work with the Census Bureau directly to distribute census data and help people use it. Um, those are excellent resources as well if you're looking for data on a community. They often have staff available to help um, answer those requests. So there are a few links you can explore for on the local source side um, later on. Those, those groups, in addition to having like neighborhood data from the city or the state, or the Census Bureau, they often have unique local data sources, um, like surveys that uh, their partners at the university have done, or in some cases, surveys they've done themselves, which um, have local data that is not available from any other source. So I'd encourage you to look for those as well to really uh, 
paints a much more clear picture of local communities that you can't always obtain from census data. And those would include um, some of the questions about uh, affordable housing or food security, which relate closely to economic security of families. Often you can you can obtain those through the census data sort of um, as a proxy, but sometimes the questions are much richer, especially around health issues uh, using local survey data if it's available. And often you'll see that data published at a national level, but to provide it locally, like at a neighborhood level or even for a city or town, you often need a local partner to um, conduct surveys that, that collect that information. I'm just before we go there, I'm going to show you the two sites at the top here. So the first is Kids Count, and they have a very, um, very easy to use interface. I think, at least uh, when you start out, there's there's a ton of data on this site, so sometimes it can be a little overwhelming. But if you start with uh, with your state. It, um, there are directions on here to guide you through, and in some states they have more detailed information. In the case of Connecticut, you can look up some of the information for the whole state, um, but if you click on the left here, you can also see they have some of it available for towns or county subdivisions, are, are named for towns in Connecticut. And you can see these are some of the key indicators that um, Kids Count and the local partner in Connecticut have decided are important uh, to looking at children's health. So these may be of, of use. And the second site here, National Center for Children in Poverty, they have a similar site. Um, one of the interesting tools on here under data tools is the demographics wizard. And it is at a state level, but I think this is a good place to start because you can um, essentially look at what information is interesting statewide, and then if you need it, if you decide it's very important, you can go back to the census and find it for your local community. So in this case, they have some pre-selected areas of interest, and if you choose a state and a, um, a topic, like parental nativity, for example, it will create a table for you showing the national rate and the Connecticut rate for those indicators, and also has a feature often here called age level where you can look at the rates for um, for younger children as well. So this can give you some basic background about your state and, again, uh, give you some guidance as to where to look uh, when you start to describe your own neighborhood or community. So now we'll talk a little bit about how to get the local data for your use. Um, some of the key concepts are the, um, the census data and the way the census collects information. It, um, for many years, the census was conducted every, every 10 years, and all of the data was collected then, both the individual count where every person is counted, as well as the long-form survey, which asks about employment and economics and many other issues. And that's changed now so that the second part of that, the longer survey, is now conducted every month so that instead of receiving data once every 10 years on those on you know economic issues at a local level, you can receive um, you know, more current estimates from your area, um, either like one-year estimates or three-year or five-year estimates for neighborhood level data like census tracts and small towns, you need to use the five-year estimates. So essentially it's taking those monthly surveys and grouping them together over a five-year period to give you the, um, the equivalent of what the census did on a one-time basis every 10 years in the past. So I'll show you some, as we go through the census website, I'll show you the difference between those two but it's important to know that that has changed. And then 
Um, margins of error are important if you're looking at a state level and then at a local level. The, the surveys are, have always been subject to a margin of error, even when they were done every 10 years. So essentially, as you get smaller and smaller groups, either smaller neighborhoods or smaller groups of individuals, like just looking at children under six, for example, that's a smaller group, the margin of error increases. So it's, it's just saying that the, the confidence level of an estimate from, of that data is, is uh, a little wider than um, the confidence level for you no know, larger area or a larger group of people. So I'll show you how that looks. And finding geographic areas, if you're not familiar with your neighborhoods or towns, the uh, census has some resources to start there. So FactFinder is the one of the best places, sort of the default place to find the census and the American Community Survey data. And about, you know, it does have millions and millions of indicators in the census, but as you learn how to filter it, it's fairly easy to find which tables um, you need for a specific topic. So I'm going to be demonstrating a few of the, um, the ways to go through that and some of the key tables are in the slides. And just to go back to the concept I discussed earlier about margins of error, this is a chart that's based on the American Community Survey data. And this, this website actually has estimates for all school districts and um, you know, sort of smaller areas and towns based on that American Community Survey. And what this is showing is the confidence intervals. So you can see the line has bands around it, like a, a shaded area around it. And with the United States, which is the blue at the top, the poverty rate is, they're very certain about it because it's, you know, they're sampling a very large number of people. So you can see the confidence interval is 0.1%. The estimate's 13.3% in 2005. And the, uh, but the range is, is pretty tight. And then for Connecticut, you can see it's a wider range. So the poverty rate was reported at 8.3. That's the estimate. But there's a confidence interval ranging from 8 to 8.7%. So um, essentially, this becomes important as you drill down into smaller areas below Connecticut, like a town or a neighborhood. You'll find the confidence interval will start to range much more. Um, and that's why. Um, when you're looking at smaller areas, you usually have to group multiple years together. So this is showing estimates for single years. And if you're looking at a neighborhood level, essentially it's going to group together five years of this data to give you the estimate for that five-year period. And I also mentioned finding your local areas, your local geographies. Before you start to, to look for data, you need to know what the geography is called, like the name of the town or the census tracts or counties that you're working with. So this is one way to do that on the census population map. I found this one. There are many different mapping tools for finding this, but this one I find is pretty easy to use. So when you go on here, you just click on one of the um, topics and type in your city. And it will zoom into your city. And it's right now it's giving the total population of the state, but you can see the levels here on the left. These are the different levels for which the census publishes information. So it's everything from a city block to a block group, which is a neighborhood of about 1,000 people, to a census tract, which is sort of the most commonly used definition of a neighborhood. And then above that, you have towns, which again are called county subdivisions, typically uh, congressional districts and other areas. And you can see if you scroll over the map to an area you're interested in, the name of the census tract appears um, here. And if you click on a neighborhood, you can get the, the value for that census tract. Um, they also have 
other uh, topics like the home ownership rate would be here under housing status, and then the you can get the rate of homes that are occupied by the owner versus the renter versus vacant. And the reason there are only a few indicators here is because this is all based on the 2010 census, and again, that survey uh, that uh, count is done every 10 years, and the benefit is it does count almost everyone. So, but the the um, data collected is limited, so they just collect the race, ethnicity, some information on the family, and the housing status, um, some basic demographics like that. So once you get to economic data and you start using the American Community Survey, you typically won't want to use um, you know, neighborhoods that are much smaller than a census tract because the, the uh, margins of error will just get very large, even with the five-year estimate. But the benefit is you'll have um, more recent data than 2010 in some cases, and you'll also have um, access to many thousands of indicators versus the handful that are published for the 2010 census. So hopefully this can orient you to your um, geographic area. So now I'm going to go into a few cases of using the census data at a local level. The um, and I'll do that on FactMinder. And again, these slides will be shared. They have some of the key table numbers I'll mention. In this, in this case, I'm going to start with single-year data where you can gather um, the population by for each age, like one-year-olds, two-year-olds, et cetera. Um, we'll also have the <coughs> tables of um, where children, young children are living by family type. So typically, um, you can get the total population for a single age year, but when it comes to the more complicated data points, um, the tables give you age ranges, so you can either look from age 0 to 5 or from 6 to 17 um, to do um, groups of ages below that. You'd probably need to um, create like a synthetic estimate where you uh, if you're looking at half of that age range, you could divide it into half and get a pretty reliable um, figure, usually. And then one of the other topics that comes up is the income levels, um, which I showed earlier, the number of young children who are in low-income families, and that comes from the American Community Survey. And then I'm going to go through a few other tables. Um, the one is on health insurance and uh, working families, preschool enrollment. These are all indicators from the American Community Survey. So we're going back to American Fact Finder. And the, um, the first thing that I typically do is enter in my geogra geographic areas. Um, there are you know, people have different ways of navigating the site, and they have really good videos to uh, orient you to using it. Um, in this case, I've already selected Connecticut. On the left here is, this is kind of like a shopping cart in uh, an online store. So you begin by adding these filters or, or um, topics that you're interested in, in this case, geography. And you can use a, the drop-down menu to do that or you can type in the name of the geography if you know it um, using this name tab. I usually go to the, the uh, drop-down. So in this case, I want Connecticut. I've already selected that. And um, county subdivision, which is the towns in Connecticut. So I'm going to select one of our towns here. You could select all and get all of them at once if you need that, or you can select um, a few using like the shift key and clicks. In this case, I'm just going to pick one. And then I'm going to add another geography, which is the census tract. And that's the neighborhoods that I showed you earlier on the population map. This will make you go through 
again, picking the census tracts, track, which are based on counties. And on the map before, I found one that, that I was interested in called 1415 in New Haven County. So I'm going to add that. That's the neighborhood I'm interested in. And then you close this, and you'll see up here, like a shopping cart, the selections are still active. So one of the first things that you would maybe look at are these basic tables. They're called selected characteristics. And these give you some sort of uh, most commonly used indicators for the areas that you're interested in. Um, on the right, you'll see the data set. In this case, it's, it's um, showing you by default, the most recent one available. So that's the um, 2011 five-year estimate, which is data from 2011 plus the four years before it um, aggregated into one five-year estimate. And that's what allows you to, um, to look at the census tract level. You'll notice if I were to remove this census tract selection, I would also get options of data sets for 2012, but they wouldn't be the five-year estimates. They would be like one-year estimates, which are published for, for Connecticut as well as New Haven Town. So it's sort of, um, it gives you the search results based on what you've selected. So if you select a, um, a census tract, you'll only be able to look at the five-year estimates. And an example of that table is the economic characteristics table. You just click on this, and you can download it into Excel. And it's giving you, again, the most, some of the more common economic characteristics for those areas. And you can see Connecticut on the left, the town in the center, and the census tract on the right. And one of the common questions would be the unemployment rate. So you can see um, they're giving you the um, unemployment rate here, 8.5%. And you can see that with that five-year estimate, the, the uh, margin of error is pretty tight. It's plus or minus 0.2%. And then for New Haven, it's thir about 13 plus or minus 1%. For the census tract, however, you can see there's a big range. Even with the five-year estimate, the range is plus or minus 6%. But it definitely shows that the unemployment rate in this census tract is much, much higher than either the state or the city. So these, these basic tables can give you often um, the data you're looking for, which is sort of the um, essential demographics, like the foreign-born population, the type family structure, um, and uh, housing characteristics, like whether people are paying uh, are severely burdened in their housing costs. Um, now I'm going to look for single year estimates, which are the single age ranges. And what, there are different ways to do that. One is to, if you know the data set, like for example, for the single year estimates, you would know that the um, data was from the 2010 census. The American Community Survey is not going to give you that level of data where every single person is counted. So you could begin to filter to that using the 2010 data. And you can see it's now the data sets are limited to the 2010 census. And one of the top tables there is the single years of age. It's the QT, P2, and if you Click on that, you'll see that um, all of the data, um, male and female for each age, is available here for Connecticut and then also for the other geographies. So this is based on the count of everyone, how many children um, are in each age, age group by year for those geographies. Um, this is a little bit more advanced, but when you select these data sets, there's an SF1 table for the 2010 census. There's also an SF2, which allows you to filter by race and ethnicity. So if you're looking for a very particular um, race or ethnicity, um, kind of across the board, like you're just interested in Vietnamese 
residents, for example, then you could actually set that as a filter using this collection and use the SF2 tables, which um, basically cross-tab all of the data instantly on your screen to just looking at the race and ethnicity groups or ancestry groups that you're interested in. But I won't go into that now. Now another topic that I mentioned is the family type. So one way to find these is to, if you know the table number, you can actually type in P, P20, for example, and that table will come up uh, automatically. But let's say you don't know the, um, the table number, so I'm going to go back to the filter and, and unselect that P20. One way to start finding them is if you know some of the keywords. Um, so, for example, household type. You can set that as a filter, like a text filter. You can see up here on the left the household type is a filter. And then you're getting the tables that have to do with household type. So. Here's P20 at the bottom, the households by presence of children. And that's an interesting table um, because it tells you essentially where children are living, uh, which types of families, the way the census defines the, those, housing, those uh, family types. In this case, it's by relationship, so um, showing the number of children under six that are in a family, in a husband-wife family versus female householder with no husband present, and there are also a few children in non-family households. And this actually breaks it down three different, two different ways, so it's not just the um, household type, but it's also whether the household has any children at all in it. back now, and now we're interested in the low-income population, which is based on the ratio of income to poverty that's calculated for each person. So to find that, you'd have to remove any filters you had, like the 2010 census, you'd want to remove that to go back again. You have the ACS data selected um, sort of by default, and then you could start typing in keywords again, such as ratio of income to poverty, that comes up automatically when you use the word ratio. And here it's actually giving you options. You can use the 2011 five-year, the 2010 five-year, or the 2009. And the selected tables, that's similar to the SF2 I mentioned earlier, where you can cross-tabulate data by race or ethnic groups. In this case, we look at the most recent data, and you can see um, this is giving you the um, number, sort of estimated number of children by age, um, uh, by also by the ratio of income to poverty. So whether um, they're eligible for different programs would depend on how they fall into this scale. There are simpler tables as well. I just happened to choose one of the more complicated ones. Um, so in addition to using those keywords to filter, you can search here on the left by topic. <coughs> the topic are, uh, would be one of the ACS measures, such as income and earnings, or poverty. So to find a table like that, you could also just set poverty as a topic filter. And you'd see these are options of tables from 2011 that have um, poverty as one of the dimensions in the table. So the easier tables, the simpler tables, tend to be at the top, like that economic characteristics table I showed you earlier, that sort of overview. And then these are also sort of overview tables, and then as you go down, they tend to get progressively more uh, complicated. So this table, for example, shows would show you the poverty status for women who 
also gave birth in the past 12 months by their marital status. So that uh, would probably be it would probably be very difficult to use that data at a neighborhood level just because the confidence intervals would be very large. But um, if that were your particular group you've identified, um, you can begin to use that data um, either at a state level or county or possibly by grouping neighborhoods together to develop an aggregate estimate. I'm going to deselect the poverty filter on the left again. And I just want to remind you, these all of the tables that are showing up here are based on the filters that I have selected. So we have Connecticut, the town, and the census tract. And these are tables available for those three. If we were to remove the census tract, you'd see that all of a sudden there are many more options, because these are other tables that um, are not published at a neighborhood level, but you can get them for a larger town or the state. So here you see now we have 20, some of the 2012 data available. That Some of this is just coming out in the past week or so. And in another few weeks, we'll have the 2012 five-year estimate available. But um, one of the topics that doesn't come up in any of the five-year estimates yet is health insurance, since that was a question recently added to the census um, questionnaire. So if you use a keyword search, you'll get all the tables related to health insurance coverage. And this was added in probably um, around the time people started talking about the Affordable Care Act as a way to, to measure how many people actually have insurance, which surprisingly we weren't doing uh, very well before. So in this case, you can look up health insurance by age, which is the one I've showed you. And you'll see here, health insurance by age is available for the one year and the three year estimates now, but it's not yet available for five years. It just hasn't been collected for five years yet. So I'm going to look at the three year estimate. Um, the three years usually much more accurate than the one year estimate for anything below a state level um, or a county level. So this shows you the population by gender and by age that has health insurance or doesn't have health insurance. And again, this can be downloaded or, um, or saved. You can bookmark it and send it to other people. The, um, if you're interested in sort of uh, how these questions are calculated, like you want to look at the methodology notes, you can find uh, some metadata about the questions you know, with this with this I level, and you can go back and read the questionnaire if you really want to see how that's calculated and some of the limitations or issues that there might be with the particular question. But most of these are pretty well used indicators that you shouldn't uh, have to worry about using. Um, in this case, the because the five-year sample isn't available, they don't have those crosstab uh, tables by race and ethnicity. So they have, have, however, published individual tables for the mo more common um, race and ethnic or cultural groups, um, which include African Americans and Hispanic or Latinos. Here on the next page, you can see it's broken down for whites who are not Hispanic and for Hispanic as well. There are also tables that tell you whether insurance is from a private source or a public source, and a few other things. Um, so the other the slides also have um, some of the other tables that you might look at, which include school enrollment, both uh, students who are enrolled in public or private schools, including preschools, uh, whether families are working, um, and some other cases. Um, here are a few other special cases just to mention before we wrap up for questions. Um, one is the education level of mothers. This is something that, as I showed earlier with the uh, fertility status in one of the census tables, you can actually get some of that data from the census. Um, the states often have more uh, accurate data, though, where they're counting, they're surveying mothers um, in the hospital, and um, the birth records, birth certificate records have 
uh, some data on things like whether the mother would have smoked during pregnancy, what their education level was, whether they were married, and that um, in some cases that can give you a better picture of who's giving birth in your community. Um, issues that come up related to poverty um, really extend beyond income into like uh, stress and well-being, and those would include transportation, like the length of commutes and where people are working, as well as housing costs. So there's a variety of data available on those issues at a local level. Um, some of the more complicated issues around well-being, like whether uh, families have a savings that they can rely on, those tend to be available nationally through surveys, but again, at the local level, they're not available unless a group has specifically done uh, some scientific surveys around that, which is, um, in, in many cases, the, the states or local communities have collected that data through a local survey. And food security is um, another very common indicator of stress. There's a website called Map the Meal Gap, which shows you food in, estimated food insecurity rates. And you can also use the receipt of food stamps as almost a proxy to that. Um, it's data from the census in one of the tables. And that tends to correlate strongly with food security since uh, families receiving food stamps, they often don't, the food stamps often don't last for the entire month, so there's an issue of um, being able to afford food there that's, that's correlated with food stamp receipt. Um, so just to, just to summarize, um, some of the things to do are to be very responsive to your interest areas, like using the indicators that other groups are using, um, breaking your data down by certain socioeconomic groups or by geography, um, looking for the best practices, the existing websites like Kids Count can be a great place to start, uh, especially before you start looking for local data to sort of identify what you're researching. And then the hyperlocal data can be very compelling, but just you should be cautious because it is more difficult to get. It's also undesirable um, for some uses, like in some cases you may want to use the current year data for your state, and that could be better than the, um, the multi-year averages for a community and also just more accurate in general. So um, to start with that, you want to develop some consistency of which populations you're comparing and which areas just to make it, e make it easier for yourself over time. Um, you can group smaller geographies, like the census tracts will often be too small to look at some of the smaller populations, but if you know a number of neighborhoods that are visited, you can group those together. So that's it. Thank you. So I'm going to take everyone off mute um, and see if we have any questions okay. for the phone. Anyone have any questions? Please? Hello? Yes. Hi, this is Deborah Sherna. I have a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, it's a little hard to, to hear. Um, yes, I'm concerned, and I tried to send this to you. I'm concerned about finding numbers for children in poverty who are above the poverty level, but but uh, don't whose parents don't make enough money to provide the basic necessities like diapers, and it seems to be very hard to find uh, numbers for children under three, for example. It all seems to be zero to five, and to find uh, data for children living 200 to 400 percent above the poverty level. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a good question that often comes up. The, the tables that I showed earlier with the ratios of income to poverty, those, um, those can give you like 200 to 400 percent or 400 to 500 percent. Those sort of ratios that are not quite, um, maybe not quite middle class incomes or they're middle class in a, like a high cost area where people would still need some assistance. Um, so those, those data are available. They are broken down only, as you mentioned, like for the zero to five range. And 
um, the samples are, are generally small to, to go below that, but what you can do is, um, because the number of, the population tends to be fairly similar by year within that group, you can divide by the number of years that you're looking for. So if you know there are 10,000 children under five in poverty in your town, for example, um, and you're just interested in a few years, you can divide by half and, and get a, a rough estimate that way. Yeah, but you can also consider looking at some of the sustainability websites, the ones that, that um, don't go off of federal poverty level but um, are rather basic, are, are calculating what is required for a sustainable... Um, right. right. And that might be probably even more compelling for that group. Well, we, we do have that in New Jersey. We I, I access that a lot from the uh, poverty, uh, the legal uh, uh, resource center. Um, but it can be very difficult to find the intersection of young children who are in that, that section just above the poverty level. Right. Yeah, that's one of, that's one of the tables in the census. So you can actually look at um, children under six who are in that range, like 200 to 300. Um, if you know the 300% the is about 70 five thousand dollars or something. So right, and right. The, the ratio that you might be looking for might be four hundred if you're in a high cost area because of the self sufficiency. Mm -hmm. So but depending on what your figure is, you can use that ratio to develop an estimate for young. Do you have any idea what the uh code is for that table? Because I haven't been able to find one that shows that. Yeah, it can the ratio uh, the ratio of um poverty above Two hundred percent. Yeah, I can include that in the uh, in the um, email with the slides. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and then I'll also just mention. Just uh, yeah. Mail. Okay. Go ahead with your question. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Bye. Uh, Doug, do you have a question? Enough. Any other questions? All right, well, if, if there are no other questions, thanks everyone for joining. We'll send the slides and post and, and the, uh, the webinar. And thank you for joining. And um, thank you, Mark, very much for, for um, helping us navigate through all these charts and graphs. And uh, I think all of these resources will be really, really helpful for everyone. So thank you again. Last call for questions? Last call for